Thank you for that beautiful song. That's amazing. Okay. Our scripture reading for our service today is found in Haggai, small book in the Old Testament, Haggai, and it comes from chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. You can turn with me in your Bibles or find it on your phone, however you're meeting with me this morning. Haggai, chapter 2, verses 18 to 19. Okay. Consider carefully from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider it carefully. Is there still seed left in the granary, the vine, the fig, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yet produced, but from this day on, I will bless you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. Good morning. That was loud. pastor came to visit a farmer, and uh, that's, that's loud. pastor came to visit a farmer, and uh, he asked the farmer, if you had a billion dollars, would you give it to God? And the farmer says, of course I would. And, and, and the pastor says, if you had a million dollars, would you give it to God? And the farmer says, of course I would. The pastor says, if you had two cows, would you give it to God? The farmer says, now hold on there, pastor. Cut that out. You know I've got cows. I don't normally do a topical sermon. Usually I do an exegetical. An exegetical is you pick a text and you, you uh, see what God says about that text. A topical sermon... You pick a topic and you go through and study what God has to say about that topic. Mark is awesome at topical sermons, to give you an example. But I opened my mouth at board meeting and, uh, and we were talking about the financial reports for the church. And I said, well, it sounds like there's some study here that needs to be done. And they said, great, you're preaching soon. And I said, oh... So because this is such a big topic, and we want to see what God has to say about it, not say, you know, what some Texan, skinny Texan has to say, God wants to bless you, just send me $100. This isn't that kind of a sermon, you know. So because this is such a big topic, I, I just want to especially bow down in prayer. Good morning, Father. You have given us everything, life, breath, all the world belongs to you. As we study what you have to say about returning and giving back, please don't let it again be my words and just show us what is your will, why it's your will, and how you want to bless us through it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. But we're going to spend, uh, you know, every time you talk about money, everybody goes directly to Malachi 3, right? But we're not going to beat you over the head with Malachi 3 today. We're going to go to Haggai. Haggai, for, uh, remember what we were studying in Sabbath school last quarter? Anybody? Ezra and Nehemiah. Haggai is contemporaries of Ezra and Nehemiah. They've returned to Israel, or Judea. Um, they've laid the foundations of the temple, but they kind of stopped there. Remember, there was some problems with the Samaritans, and they wanted to stop the building. So for a little bit of time, the building stopped. And then Haggai comes in with this message. But we start out with Haggai 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius, the king of, um, I'm sorry, in the second year of Darius, the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, 
to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Zadok, the priest, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, verse 2, The people says, The time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came to prophet Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses while this house is left desolate? And the first thing that we see here is the people are saying, wait a minute, it's not the right time to give to God's house. He tells Haggai a very interesting thing. He says, is it the right time to live in paneled houses? Did you catch that? In other words, when the people came back, God didn't say, okay, don't build any shelters for yourself. Just live under the stars. Build me a house. God didn't have a problem with them building their own house, having a shelter. The problem was they started making their houses nicer and nicer and nicer. And they said, well, yeah, but I don't have any money for the church because I got to get paneling. I got to get some gold trim. I got to get some nice flower pots in the front yard. And... That costs money, so I don't have as much as I need to to give to God. We're going to talk today about a few things. What is stewardship? There's four types of stewardship. Anybody name any of them? Money? Money is one. Well, that's uh, goods, right? Resources, that's one. Time, time is one. Anybody else? Talents, yes. One more. Your body is the temple of God. So we're going to talk about mostly our talents. Now, the body, God expects us to use to eat properly. I'm still working on that one. I'm working harder and harder on that one. I will get there by the grace of God and the love of my wife. My patient, patient wife. Um, God expects us to treat our body as his temple, right? The second one, time. Time. God gives us 24 hours, seven days a week, right? He expects us to give back one day, one-seventh of our time. Our talents. We have resources because we have talents. Those talents were given to us by God. So when we go into work, we need to treat our bosses, treat our jobs as if we were working for God. Does that make sense? So in everything we do, we need to do it as if to glorify God. Number four, our resources. That's where we're going to be spending most of our time today. There is a right way to give. There is a wrong way to give. There is um, what is required and what is the benefit of giving the way that God has asked us to give. So first, let's go into the requirement. What is the first example of stewardship in the Bible? Anybody? Abraham. There's one earlier than that. I thought I would get that guess. Abel. One earlier than that. Adam. I heard it over here. Adam. Adam is the very first example of stewardship in the Bible. We can find all four principles of stewardship in Genesis chapter 2. Let's go there. Uh, by the way, put a, put a finger or a marker or something in Haggai. We're going to come back to it. Now let's go over to Genesis chapter 2 and see, you see the first one, the first type of stewardship in chapter 2, verse 1, uh, verse 2 and 3, right? Where the seventh day is made holy. But if we skip down to verse 15, it says, then the Lord took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord commanded man, saying, from any of the tree of garden you may freely eat, 
But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you will die. So the very first thing is God says, okay, I want you to use your talents for me. Cultivate this garden. Right? He's already asked for time. Now he's asked for talents. He says, okay, now all of this garden is mine, but you can have all of it except for one tree. Now, I think that's probably less than a tenth of the trees that were there, but it's still a requirement that God is saying, this is separate, this is mine, don't touch it. Right? And as far as the body, he says you can eat of any of the trees of the garden, so God is prescribing to him what he should eat in order to be healthy. All four of them in the second chapter of Genesis. But this one with the tithe, he says, or the, you know, the separate, the, the part that's separate, God says, this is a big test. This is too big for Adam. So he says, verse 18, right after he said, don't touch this tree, he says, verse 18, then the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Did you know that wife was put on this earth to help man with this whole idea of some of it is separated for God? That's pretty cool, right? So our marriage relationships, they are holy, but also the tithe is holy, which is what Leviticus uh, 27.30 says, the tithe is holy. And in our marriage relationships, we need to work together to make sure that we're honoring God through our resources. God created the marriage partly for this test. Does that make sense? which I think is just, wow. So we say, well, wait a minute. Eve kind of messed that up, right? How do we know that Adam wouldn't have messed it up a lot quicker if Eve wasn't there? So that's the first example of stewardship in the Bible. Requirements. God says everything is his. He says, I planted this entire garden. I want you to cultivate it. Where else does he say all through the Bible, he says, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine, right? Let's go back to Haggai. I hope you guys kept your finger there. Haggai, chapter 2, verse 8. God is reminding the Jewish people, he says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord. Everything that you own is mine. And I'd like to take it a step further if we go over to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 25. This is Paul standing in Athens. He says, talking about God, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath and everything else. That means that even the air passing through our nose right now, keeping us alive moment by moment, is God's. Everything that we have, everything that sustains us, belongs to God. And with that, God has asked in Leviticus 27.30, let's go there, just to make sure that we have God's requirement correct. Leviticus 27, verse 30. It says, Thus all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy. To the Lord. Now, how many things in the Bible are holy? The Sabbath is holy. Marriage is holy. The tithe is holy. If we put it on that level. What kind of responsibility is that? And this is why I hate the term give tithe. You cannot give tithe. That would be like me borrowing Lisa's car 
and then giving it to somebody else. I can't give her car to somebody else. It's her car, right? You cannot give what is not yours. You can return it. So when I, when I hear somebody say, give tithe, instantly I'm saying, no, return tithe. We return the tithe because it is God's. But it's not just tithe that is holy. We are going to go there, Malachi chapter 3. Yeah, I know we go there every time. For, But it is really important. Just before Matthew, if you get to Matthew, you've gone too far. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. By the way, Malachi has a lot of great other things to say just besides tithe. It's a wonderful book. Um, Verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And tithes and offerings. That's why I bring it here, because it's important to say, not only is the tithe holy to God and required of us, but if we are tithing and not giving offerings, then we are under the same condemnation of robbing God. And to me, when I read that, that was opening and made me a little nervous. Not that I don't give offerings, but it gave me a more of a sense of the seriousness of offerings, if that makes sense. But he gives it with a promise. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing until it overflows. I don't want to, I can't take all day, I know. So I want to move quickly. We need to talk about, sorry, right ways and wrong ways to give, right? And I love stories. Uh, it's the best way that I learn, and I find it's the best way to connect with people, is stories. You can sit up here and teach doctrine all day long, and people are like, oh, yep, yep, that's true. But if you tell a story, people are with you, right? So I want to give two stories that are the wrong way to give, or at least two examples in the Bible. The first one is Acts chapter 5, verse 4. And then we'll get into all the good stuff, right? Promises and the right way to do it and all that wonderful stuff. Bear with me. Acts chapter 5, verse 4. What's happening here is, well, we can start at verse 1, Acts chapter 5, verse 1. It says, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. See that marriage thing, right? And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keeping back some of the price of the land. And we say, okay, so God wants everything, right? He wants us to just give up everything and give it to him. That's not what it's saying. It says, verse 4, While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it then that you conceived this deed in your heart that you have Have you not lied? You have not lied to men, but to God. You have to ask, why would it be that he would keep back part of it, but say that he had sold it for the full amount? Why would he do that? Anybody? He wants to make sure that people know he's supporting the church with everything he has. So, in other words, he's giving to impress people. Not to honor God. 
And Peter says, it was yours. If you wanted to keep part of it back, you could just say, you know, I'll sell a piece of land and I'll give the church 80%. Fine, great. We'd be happy with the 80%. But you said you gave 100% and you didn't. The sin was not in the gift, but in the lie. The second example, Matthew chapter 23 Verse 23. Jesus, I, I love, I wanted to bring this one in because you say, well, maybe the tithe is just a Jewish thing. Maybe it's not a requirement anymore. Matthew 23, 23. This is Jesus giving his last oration in the temple. And he's not saying some very nice things to the priests and the rabbis. He says, verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tie the tenth, you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. But these are things you should have done without neglecting the others. In other words, you should still return your tithe. But if you don't love people, if you don't love God, you can give everything you have and it will do you absolutely no good. The two examples of the wrong way to give, either to hold something back and lie, and both of them are about outward appearance. Giving just to show other people, look what I can do for God. Look how holy I am because I am giving to God. And this was, people were holding back in Haggai's time. And what was the result of it? Let's go back to Haggai. Haggai chapter 1, verse 7. The result of not giving the way that God has asked us to give. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 7 of chapter 1. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased and glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts, because my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. He says, if you're not giving, then, you know, sometimes you say, well, I can't afford to return a tithe. I'm broke. And God says, if you're too broke to return a tithe, you will always be too broke. That's a harsh reality, right? It's sort of like saying, and this is why it's important, it's like saying, I'm too much of a sinner to come to Jesus. If you wait to become perfect before you come to Jesus, you will never come to Jesus. And that's what the whole thing is about. It's not about money. God says, all the gold is mine. All the silver is mine. God doesn't need our money. What he needs is us to say, everything is yours. And you're going to take care of me. And I'm going to trust you. That's what tithe and offering is all about trust. So the right way to give. By the way, there is a, there is, you should work out with God how much you give, but there is, you know, an amount that you should give out of your own heart, out of your own generosity. It's not just tithes, it is offering. It's sort of like the kid riding with his parents from home from church and the dad says, you know, the sermon was horrible. This guy rambled on for 40 minutes, and I didn't get a point that he was saying. And the wife says, yeah, and the music was terrible, too. Not the music today. The music today was beautiful. But the wife says, yeah, the music today was terrible, too. And the kid pipes up and says, I don't know. I thought it was a pretty good show for a buck. You need to, out of your heart, give as God has given to you. 
Okay, the right way to give. A couple of examples. i got to hurry. Luke chapter 21, verse 4. I love this one. Uh, it's uh, to the right of Haggai. Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 21, verse 4. Actually, let's start out with verse 1 and that one too. Luke 21, 1. This is Jesus is standing uh, there at the temple again, and he says, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. Now that's less than a penny that she put in. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they out of their surplus put in the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had. By the way, uh, a side note here. Do you realize that the church that she just supported was the one that killed Jesus? Did you realize that Jesus put in charge of the treasury Judas, who betrayed him and was stealing from the treasury? I mention that because sometimes, you know, there's things that I don't agree with. There's one thing in particular that I don't agree with with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and that is the separation of conferences. I hate it. But should I withhold my tithe from the Seventh-day Adventist Church because I have an issue with the separation of conferences? No, I don't have that right. Jesus has led an example of you are supporting God when you give to his church. It doesn't matter if you disagree with one or two things or something within the church. If you withhold your tithe and say, well, I'm going to give it to Good News TV or I'm going to give it to 3ABN. I'm not saying don't give to 3ABN or don't give to Good News TV. Those are wonderful things, but those aren't tithe. That's an offering. And tithe is to support our ministers. In a small part, the teachers, very small part, the teachers that teach here, they get a small part of their salary from our tithes. Offerings support this church if it's local church budget. If you don't give anything to offerings, you are not giving a penny to support this church. Sure, your pastor gets paid, which is good. We need the pastor. By the way, I don't get a penny either. No matter what you give to, tithe or offering. All right, the, the second one is John chapter 19, verse 38. John chapter 19, the second one of giving. John chapter 19, verse 38. This is after Jesus has died on the cross. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body, verse 39. Nicodemus, who had at first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh, aloe, and a hundred, uh, about a hundred pounds weight. That's a lot of perfume, a hundred pounds. The tomb was Joseph's tomb. That is an extravagant gift. The myrrh that Nicodemus brought was worth, some people say, between $150,000 and $200,000 worth of perfume to anoint Jesus' body. These are offerings that they gave free of will. They said, look at what Jesus has done. Look at who he is. I want to give out of the kindness of my heart because I've seen what Jesus did for me. I've seen what God has done for me. That's what offering is all about. It's not about let me make sure that I can look good in front of the church or let me make sure that this is taken care of. It's God has taken care of me. I trust him. And because I trust him, and because I love him, I'm going to give of what he gave to me. The last thing, last couple things that I want to look at as we wrap up. Matthew 6, 
of verse 24. Matthew 6, verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other. You cannot be, devo be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. We can't build our houses up. I'm not saying you can't have nice things. Obviously, Joseph and Nicodemus were wealthy. Jesus didn't despise them for being wealthy. It wasn't a crime. It wasn't a sin to have nice things. But the point is, if we are supporting what we want and building our treasure up here, then we cannot also serve God. And that's where he gets into verse 19, chapter 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And this is the point for where your treasure is there your heart will be also. You see, the sermon for this title is God's Trust Fund. We talk about retirement. And Jesus says, I have the greatest retirement plan. We all know it. We can all say it by heart. John 14, verse 1. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and restore you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Our tithe is showing God, yes, I know you've given me everything. I trust you to take care of my everyday needs. Our offering is saying, Lord, I am so glad that you have blessed me with the things that I have. I, this, I, I want to make sure that your causes are supported. Do you realize we have a unique position in this church? We are in Scottsdale, Arizona. You look around at the price tags of the houses in this area. This is a fairly wealthy area, right? Jesus says it is harder for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than for the rich to reach the kingdom of heaven. You think that we're in a great mission field? This is an awesome mission field. This is... Everybody here needs to know about Jesus. But this church needs your support. I want to read one last text in closing. Actually, to um, we'll go to 1 John first. 1 John chapter 2. I just love 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, all the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and all its lust. But he who does the will of God will live forever. The thing is, if we're building up because I like cars, because I like motorcycles, I love all those things. But if I say, I want a new guitar, and if I give an extra, if I give what I want to, to offering this morning, I can't afford that money for the guitar. So I'm going to give a little less of my offering so that I can get the guitar. That's loving the world over loving God. It's not a problem to have the guitar. It's just an indication of where our heart is. The last one I want to read is back to Haggai. We'll close with this. Haggai chapter 2, verse 18, our text for today. See, when Haggai gave this message, they said, okay, we're excited, let's build the church. And they started building the church. Haggai is one of the most successful prophets in the Bible because when he talked, you know, when he gave God's message, the people actually listened to him. That's cool. So when they listened to him, God says, verse 18, 
Do consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, consider, is the seed still in the barn, even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree, it has not yet borne fruit. You don't know yet what God has in store for you. He says, you haven't even seen the results But because today, and I'm marking the day, and this is why I wanted to bring this up. I am marking the time right now. You have made a commitment to me, and I am saying right now from this commitment, not after I've seen what you did for six months, but right now when you have made this commitment, I am committing to bless you. I hate prosperity messages because it says, well, If I give, then God's going to bless me. And what does that do for the poor, starving kid in Africa? Does God not love him because he is not blessed? Not all blessings are in this life. He's going to prepare a place for us. We have no idea of the blessings that he has in store for us. But I do know that he has said, The moment that we've made a commitment to serve him, to trust him, to say, yes, I am committed to returning my tithe and to giving an offering of my resources that you have given me. As soon as we've made a commitment to do that, God says, from this day forward, I am going to bless you. Thank you.